Okay. There we go. Here come some folks now. Real quick, got to make sure. Thank you. All right, here come folks now. Welcome in, everybody. All right, cool. Some folks are coming in. Uh, while we're waiting for more folks to join, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat your name and where you're calling in from so we can get the conversation started. We're looking to make this as interactive as possible. So throughout the presentation, we'll take a few breaks to bring in questions and comments uh, from the chat and the Q&A function. So I'll make sure to read those out. But you can feel free to start a dialogue in the chat at any time. Uh, thank you, Sean, from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Great to have you with us. Stacy Ebert from Alvin Community College in Alvin, Texas. Welcome, Stacy. Welcome, Sean. All right, great. We're getting kind of a quorum going here. So I'll get things started with my MC role in just a moment. Hey, Gary. I Hi, think er Hi, Ernestine. Hi, Ernestine. Welcome, welcome. You've been on a couple of these recently. It's great to have you with us. Uh, hey, Gary, do you mind? It looks like I don't have permission to. Do you mind starting the closed captions? Sure. Let me see here. Stop recording. Where do I see that, Nick? Live transcript? Yep. Click that, and then I think you click enable, and that'll go. That way we'll have the okay. perfect. Done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's going fine. Thank you very much. All right, folks, just a couple of housekeeping things and then we'll get rolling because we've got a packed hour here. Uh, my name is Nick Houle. I'm joining you from Northeast Ohio. I'm the Director of Client Engagement here at the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. And I'll be running point kind of tech emceeing, if you will, uh, here for this webinar presentation with Gary Schoniger, the founder of Eli, who I'll hand it over to in just a moment. A uh, couple housekeeping items. As you joined, I'm sure you heard uh, the lovely Zoom voiceover tell you that this is being recorded. So we will share that recording with everyone within 24 hours, along with the slides and some links to things that we'll mention throughout the webinar event. Um, as I mentioned when you were joining, if you could drop any questions, comments, concerns, pushback that you have in the chat, as well as the Q&A function, that'll help us keep this engaging and bring a lot of uh, more depth to the conversation, because we're going to go over a lot of stuff here today, and we want to make sure folks are getting something out of it wherever they can. Um, so without further ado, Gare, I think we're good to hand it over to you. How many breaks are we taking just so folks can keep that? I, I think I have one in the middle, Nick, and then one, one in at the middle. end. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so yeah, keep yeah. your questions kind of... coming throughout, though, and, and no worries. We'll hop back to different topics, things like that, uh, if if need be. So yeah. Yeah. And uh, Kathleen, hi, hi, Kathleen. Great to have you with us, as always. And Kyle, uh, thank you for joining us. It's great to have you. So go ahead and take it away, Gare. All right. Let me see if I can share my screen. Let me start by doing that. Mm -hmm. That's always the weird part. And I got to yep. get this out of the way. Hit play. Why isn't it hitting play? There it is. There you go. Okay. You can see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Nick. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, I really like doing these webinars. I'm excited to share with you uh, a little bit about what we know about the entrepreneurial mindset, what it is, where it comes from, why we need it, and how to cultivate it in ourselves and others. I'm going to go pretty quick here. Uh, and, you know, I might go over a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it to an hour. Uh, there's a lot here I want to share with you. I want to make this webinar a standalone value for you, not just uh, a sales pitch. So uh, uh, here it goes. Let me just kind of jump right in and let's take it from there. So, so to begin with, my name is Kerry Scheiniger. I'm the founder and CEO of Eli. We're the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. We're the world's leading provider of entrepreneurial mindset, education, training, and professional development. We're now starting to do a lot more work in organizational development now around the idea of entrepreneurial leadership and organizational development. So that's who we are. That's what we do. 
Uh, when it comes right down to it, I've been trying to figure out for more than 30 years the simple question of how underdogs win. And I don't know how to say it any better, but the idea is how do ordinary people who have no particular advantage in terms of education, you know, intelligence, uh, access to resources, power, privilege, how do ordinary people manage to alter their place in the socioeconomic structure? And I, you know, ultimately what I found is they're all entrepreneurial in some way. And, and this is a, a topic that I'm fascinated with, but I, I, I want to say that that I don't think of it in terms of necessarily as a business discipline. And I think when we think of entrepreneurship as a business discipline, we sort of limit our ability. We, we create this bounded rationality that prevents us from fully understanding it. So, so you know, long story short, 2008, I was hired by the Cisco Entrepreneur in Institute in San Jose, California, to do a gap analysis on the entrepreneurship education ecosystem in North America. And it was there that I got to see very quickly that the way entrepreneurship is typically portrayed in a classroom is largely divorced from the reality of what a typical entrepreneur is actually doing. Now, you know, I only really understood that from a limited perspective, my own entrepreneurial experience, just, you know, being around other entrepreneurs, I, I quickly understood, you know, they're not generally writing business plans and pitching investors. You know, they don't have venture capital, they don't necessarily have big ideas, they're just ordinary people. They're engaged in what I would call self directed value creation. So I went back to Cisco and they said, well, what are entrepreneurs actually doing? And I said, well, you know, there's some data, there's not a lot, but there's, you know, I, I can tell you from a more of an anecdotal perspective, but, you know, this is worthy of, of some greater research. And so Cisco gave me a platform to go around the United States and interview hundreds of uh, about 200 uh, what I would call everyday entrepreneurs. I'm not really interested in, you know, interviewing Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Richard Branson or Mark Zuckerberg. I'm interested in the everyday entrepreneur who takes a few hundred or a few thousand dollars, turns an idea into something sustainable that not only creates value for their communities or their organizations, but also that create value for themselves. And so that's where I met uh, Clifton Talbert, one of the entrepreneurs that I interviewed, uh, Clifton Talbert, what, he's one of the founders of the Stairmaster Exercise Company. And when I asked him how he learned how to think like an entrepreneur, he showed me this picture of his uncle Cleve and explained to me that he had been born in this Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta in the 1940s, born to a teenage mother, didn't really know a dad until he was well into adulthood. And he said, I was picking cotton. This was the, expect of, the expected way of life for people that looked like me. And he said, except for this man, and he showed me this picture. He said, when I was 13 years old, I went to work at, alongside my uncle Cleve, and he was the man that owned the ice house. And, and, you know, I heard hundreds of amazing stories, but this particular story really got at something that I was striving to understand. And a couple of years later, Clifton and I uh, reconvened uh, uh, to collaborate to uh, co-author a book called Who Owns the Ice House? And the subtitle, which is Eight Life Lessons from an Unlikely Entrepreneur, are essentially eight core concepts that we distilled from hundreds of entrepreneurs. They're simply told through Clifton's story. And then with some initial funding with a program-related investment from the Kauffman Foundation, we created a curriculum around the Ice House program that's now gone all over the world. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later. In a second part, I'll tell you how that works. 
But nevertheless, I want you to understand the research and the thinking and the philosophy behind our work. My hope is that this webinar will, will sort of get you to think about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education a little bit differently. So where are we in the world, right? The world has changed in ways that now require all of us to be more innovative and entrepreneurial, regardless of our station, regardless of our chosen path. And perhaps another way to say that is that the mindset that once enabled us to succeed is rapidly becoming obsolete or Maybe obsolete isn't a, the right word, maybe inadequate in the, in the face of, of change. So I, I coined this new term called entrepreneurials. And, and it's sort of a tongue in cheek on millennials, except that they're not beholden to a particular generation as much as they're beholden to a particular logic, the, the, a mindset. And, and so, and, and so it, it doesn't necessarily mean they own the business. It, it just means they're innovative and entrepreneurial in their approach to their work and to life. And when we look at folks who, who display these, these attributes, let's call them, uh, what we see are people who are, who are uh, creative and critical thinkers. There are people who are resilient and resourceful. They're able to start where they are and use what they have to make things happen when, when the rules aren't clear, when the path is not well-defined. And when we, when we look at these, ad, what we see are the attributes of, that we not only want to cultivate in ourselves. I mean, these are people that are highly motivated. They're, they're optimally engaged. And, and we see these attributes that we want to not only cultivate in ourselves in terms of professional development, but also these are attitudes and skills we want to cultivate in our children, in our students, in our workforce, our organizations, and our communities, more broadly speaking, right? So what I want to get at this afternoon or this morning, uh, where, depending on where you are in the world, uh, is, is th these three questions. Essentially, what is an entrepreneurial mindset? Where does it come from? How can we develop it in ourselves and others? So what I want to do is sort of let's break it apart, right, in, into two separate ideas. The first is the mindset as a hidden mechanism that influences our behavior, mostly without our awareness. The second is entrepreneurship as a means of optimizing engagement and unlocking human potential. So I think of entrepreneurship much more broadly than just startup. Now, to be clear, if you're in the startup game, I think we can reduce the failure rate by half by understanding a few basic things. So, so it's still relevant for people who are in the startup game. But in our world, we're encouraging people to think beyond startup and recognize that these are the attitudes and skills the world now demands. So let me start with the mindset, right? Let me begin there. I think this is the more important of the two, actually. As I'm fond of saying lately, it's 99% mindset and it's 1% entrepreneurship. And in my research at Cisco, what I found is that entrepreneurship education initiatives tended to focus on managerial functions that were that were all about management and that were all of there were technical technical functions, but they were ignoring the underlying beliefs and values and assumptions that led the person to 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 be entrepreneurial. They also tend to conflate entrepreneurial attitudes and skills with managerial attitudes and skills. And those are two very, very different things and I'll get more into that later. But the point is we all have a mindset, yet very few of us are aware of it, much less the ways in which it influences our behavior without our conscious awareness. It took me a long time to figure this out. You know, I looked in the literature, I scoured the literature for some sort of a meaningful definition of mindset. I mean, we all use that term. We, we toss it around. 
you know, casually without really understanding what it is, how it functions. And, and, you know, I looked at Carol Dweck's work who wrote the book called Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. And unfortunately, she just described it as a way of thinking, which, which I found inadequate for, for, for my understanding and my needs. So, so the answers came in my, in my research around culture. And it finally dawned on me that a mindset is to an individual what culture is to a group. It functions exactly the same way. And so now this gave me the, the structure and the language to talk about a mindset because it functions just like culture. So here is Edgar Schein's definition of culture. He describes it as the pattern of shared basic assumptions learned by a group as it solved its problems of external adaptation and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. I know it's a little bit clunky, but it's worth it's worth saying, I mean, it's very, very precise. And so according to Shine and others who study culture, it works like this, and we'll use the tried and true iceberg model. On the surface, we see the visible artifacts and observable behaviors. That's what we can see and touch, right? Beneath the surface, we find our explicit knowledge in our espoused values. This is what we know we know and what we say we value, right? But beneath the surface, we find at level three are deeply held values and taken for granted assumptions of which we're mostly not aware. That's how culture works. And so what Shine is saying is that what shows up on the surface, the visible artifacts and the observable behaviors are the result not of our level two knowledge and, and values, but of our level three uh, values and assumptions of which we're mostly not aware. And so a mindset works exactly the same way. You can read, you know, read Edgar Shine's book on culture and replace the word culture with mindset. And it, 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 it's a perfect replacement. It works very, very well. So my definition of mindset is a derivative of Shine's definition of culture. It's a pattern of beliefs, assumptions, and mental models learned by an individual that worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore assumed to be the correct way to perceive, think, and feel. Now, when I say assumed, I mean level three assumed. So the, it's also important to understand that the purpose of a mindset is to enable us to think without thinking. And that's the same reason we have culture. It allows us to function as a set of rules, unwritten or written rules that enable us to function as a group. Well, mindset works exactly the same way. It allows us to, to navigate life. And, and here's, here's how it works, right? Our brains are inundated with billions of bits of data that pour in through our five senses every second. And yet, we're only able to process a handful uh, 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 of these uh, 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 inputs. And so our brains must rely not only on filtering systems that block out almost everything, blocks out everything deemed non-threatening or irrelevant, right? But our brains also rely on rules of thumb and habits, uh, uh, heuristics, uh, uh, that enable us to, to uh, navigate without thinking, right? These simple rules of thumb so we don't have to think every time we, we approach a problem. It's important to understand that our mindset is both consciously and unconsciously acquired. 
So let's look at the conscious acquisition, right? We learn something. It comes in at level two, right? Your first day at your new job, you get trying to find your way to work and you're looking at the map in your phone and you know, you're paying very close attention to how to get there. By the fourth day, you're no longer paying attention. By the end of the second week, you drove all the way to work talking to your friend on the phone and you never, you don't even know how you got there, right? So it works like this. Once our brains accept a particular schema as the correct way to think and feel in relation to a particular problem, our brains then relegate that schema to habitual control in order to reduce the cognitive load. So it drops to level three. But once it does that, we're not aware of it. And that's where the problem lies. Some of our values and assumptions are, are acquired unconsciously through the forces of socialization as well as through our own subjective interpretation of our experiences and life events, right? So these the beliefs and assumptions that we acquire unconsciously, we also acquire uncritically. Note to self. Now, again, the main point here is that a mindset is a belief system that is perfectly designed to create the outcomes that it creates. That's a really important point here, right? And, and so what happens though, it is, you know, there's this, it's a, it's a cognitive bias called the uh, self-serving bias. So when things go well, we take credit for it. Yet when things go poorly, we tend to blame others. We tend to look outside of ourselves for causal attribution. And it's not because we're all sociopaths. It's because we're not aware of our level three values and assumptions and, and how our level three values and assumptions contributed to those negative outcomes, right? It's a, it's a normal it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a moral or a character failure. It's a glitch in the way our brains work. So there's two things I want to say uh, uh, about the mindset that are important. One is, I think of a mindset as the hidden mechanism that regulates the output we get from the capabilities we have. Right, you can have a, a 400 horsepower engine, but if your mindset is such, you might only get 100 horsepower of capacity out of your engine. Then you got a guy over here who's got a 200 horsepower engine, but his mindset is such that he knows how to get all 200 horsepower out of the engine. He's naturally better off than the guy with the 400 horsepower engine. So that's a way to think about it. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the mechanism that regulates our ability to, to, to uh, uh, capture whatever capabilities we have. But there's another dimension of a mindset that, that is also worth thinking about. And it works like this. Our mindset is a feature. It's an evolutionary feature when we want the future to look like the past. Right. It enables us to get better and better and navigate with less and less cognitive load. The mindset becomes a bug, however, in the face of change. Right. Our, our mindsets are often get in the way in the face of adaptive challenge. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. In our work, we think of five, you know, five let's call them mindset dimensions that are important to think about, right? Perceived locus of control, a deeply held assumption about, you know, whether or not I'm in control of my life or a deeply held belief that fate or luck or circumstances or powerful others control our lives. Now, again, these aren't conscious beliefs. Right. We're not walking around saying, 
hi, my name's Gary. I have an external locus of control. Yet you can see what shows up on the surface, right? You can see that I have an external locus of control because I'm complaining all the time, because I'm spending all of my discretionary time and effort entertaining myself rather than learning or challenging myself, right? It's one example of a mindset. We look at whether or not we are intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. Right, researchers have begun to recognize that different types of goals elicit different types of motivation, right? That have an enormous impact on our behavior. The fixed growth orientation, this is Carol Dweck's work, right? We have a fixed mindset. We believe that our intelligence and our capabilities are finite. They're, 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 they're not changeable. Whereas other people have a growth orientation, which is the assumption that we can learn things, we can, we can, we can try and through effort, we can change and improve and grow. These deeply held beliefs have an enormous impact on the type of goal we set for ourselves, right? Someone with a fixed mindset is less likely to set goals for themselves outside of their comfort zone. They won't risk looking stupid. They won't risk doing things that expose their inadequacies or their perceived inadequacies, I should say. Whereas someone with a growth mindset will set for themselves more challenging goals. They're more willing to look stupid. They're more willing to go outside of their comfort zone in, in order to learn and to grow. Optimism and pessimism are also important to consider. There is definitely a hereditary component here. It's not to be dismissed, but we, it's well established that we can teach ourselves to be optimistic. And, and the, the optimism is essentially the underpinning, the psychological underpinning of uh, what psychologists would call resilience. And then lastly, I think the big, the big idea here is more broadly, you know, a thought of as perceived self-efficacy. People with high self-efficacy set high goals for themselves. They stick to their goals in the face of challenges and setbacks, whereas low self-efficacy beliefs result in low goals, easily giving up in the face of, of challenge. So those are some of the constructs or, or the dimensions of a mindset. That's kind of how we think about it. All right, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about entrepreneurship as a means of optimizing engagement and unlocking human potential. You know, the, 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 the big thing, you know, if, if, if we just think for a minute about how important entrepreneurial activity is, not only for our own, you know, uh, a benefit, but from our from an economic perspective, let alone a development perspective, it's essential that we get this right. As important as entrepreneurship is, it's still not well understood, and and um, you know our ability to embrace embrace entrepreneurship more broadly is limited in by the ways in which we define it. And, and a lot of people hear the word entrepreneur and it conjures the image of the titans, you know, the 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 venture-backed high growth billionaire types. Some people think of an entrepreneur as a small business owner. Some people think of an entrepreneur as an evil, you know, exploitative person. And while I understand there are good reasons for each of these perspectives, they do not accurately reflect the mindset, the motivation, or the methods of a typical entrepreneur. And without getting into a lot of deal about this, if you if you want to if if you decide to join our facilitator training, our entrepreneurial mindset facilitator training, certification training, we'll go into this in a lot greater detail. But it, it took me about twenty five years to figure this out to arrive at this conclusion. 
this definition of entrepreneurship as the self-directed pursuit of opportunities to create value for others. And the kicker here is that by creating value for others, we can empower ourselves. Now, why I like this definition is because anyone can embrace this, right? You don't need to start a company to understand this way of thinking. The more useful we become, the better off we're going to be. So I can embrace this way of thinking, whether I'm working in a fast food restaurant, in a university, or I want to set out to change the world. It doesn't really matter. The basic idea nested in entrepreneurship is it's the self-directed pursuit of opportunities to create value for others. I said it earlier, it's, it's self-directed value creation. The attitudes and skills required for self-directed value creation are the 21st century skills the world now demands. They don't always call them entrepreneurial skills. They call them soft skills, which I don't like, you know, whatever you want to call them, they're entrepreneurial skills, right? They're the creativity, the critical thinking, the self-direction, the collaboration, the teamwork. All of these skills are skills that anyone is capable of developing. They're simply skills that have historically been overlooked or undervalued or ignored within a, a formal uh, education systems. Now, for those of you who are uh, 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 educators, faculty members, teachers, whatever, uh, don't lose sight of the fact that the opportunity discovery process, the entrepreneurial process, creates a very powerful incentive to learn. And, and one of the things we observe in entrepreneurs, they're, they're, they're likely to be avid, self-directed, lifelong learners. I'll explain why here in a second, right? So, you know, Csikszentmihalyi is the guy that uh, wrote about flow, and he uses this term autotelic, like when we become optimally engaged. And, and so what happens to a person when we are challenged above our skill level, when the when we're, when we're challenged too far out of our skill, our range of skills and knowledge, we become very anxious. It's very difficult for our brain to function properly. By contrast, what happens to us when our skill level exceeds the challenge? Right? We become bored and disengaged. And by the way, two-thirds of students leave high school not engaged in learning. And two thirds of workers in North America are not engaged in their work. Right? The number is greater on a global scale. 87% not engaged in their work. But when we look at entrepreneurial people, they tend to be what I call optimally engaged. Now, why is that? And this is, the, this is really the linchpin here. It's the compelling nature of the goal that pulls them into the future, right? The goal acts on the individual in ways that, that elicit optimal engagement. As a result, what we see in entrepreneurial people, they tend to have an internal locus of control. They tend to be purpose-driven and therefore intrinsically motivated. They have a growth mindset. They realize that they can learn whatever they need to learn in order to get where they want to go. They also have to have an above average sense of optimism, which I believe is the result of the compelling nature of the goal. And we also see over time, they have an increased sense of self-efficacy. My point here is very, very simple. The entrepreneurial mindset is not the cause of entrepreneurial behavior. It's an effect, right? The cause of entrepreneurial behavior is the innate tendency 
towards self-actualization. It's the individual trying to figure out how to pursue their interests and develop their capabilities in ways that contribute to the greater good. That desire to fulfill human needs through our own effort and intellect is an essential part of what makes us human. It's not just in some of us, it's in all of us, right? But the entrepreneurial mindset is an effect. It, in the beginning, we don't know what the heck we're doing. These things evolve over time. So I'm gonna pause here for just a minute and, and see if we have any questions, Nick. And if not, I'm gonna just jump back in to talking to a little bit about Ice House and how our programs work and how we advocate for teaching entrepreneurship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see someone has their hand raised. Unfortunately, we're not taking live questions. So if you could type your question out, that would be great. That's my good friend, Jim Myers from Florida. Oh, hi, Jim. I see you joined us late. I didn't see you sneak in there. Yeah, he did. He snuck in from the right from the rip. <laughs> good, good. Jim and I uh, present co-presented together at uh, NACI in Boston, I think it was. Wasn't that right, mm -hmm. Jim? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any any uh, questions here? Let's see, Jim. Hello. I was on time, but didn't introduce. Yes. Shame on you. Shame on you. Yes. Well, um, back to the list of skills. What is the state of being able to evaluate these skills? Oh, that's an interesting question, Sean. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Sean. Um, you know, there are that the, we have a psychometric tool that we've developed to be able to evaluate. And it's based on, you know, it's based on uh, locus of control, perceived self-efficacy, intrinsic, extrinsic motivation. There are other psychometric tools. We have one, you know, attached to the Ice House program. You can talk to the folks at the Entrepreneurial Mindset Profile. Is that what it is? EMP, yep. Nick? E EMP In out Florida? of Eckerd College, yep. Yeah, they've also developed a psychometric tool. Um but what I'll say, I mean, I mean, Sean, that, that sometimes when I say evaluating these skills, I, I know you guys are being asked to measure it. It's just like it's a long game. And, and, and that, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, so Jim Myers is asking, is the approach different for a small business entrepreneur than a large startup person? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know. But knowing the difference is the key here, Jim, and it's a really important question, right? So, you know, everybody thinks they've got the next big thing, and all they need is the money that's going to allow them to launch their business, which in most times is, you know, a hallucination. But but there is a different approach. If, if, it's, if it's, you know, the high-tech, biotech, you know, pharma, type startup, then yeah, you're going to need investment and you should spend your time pursuing investment for the vast, vast, vast majority of entrepreneurs. Writing a business plan and pursuing outside investment is a waste of time. So be happy to elaborate on that. If, if I've ruffled any feathers, I apologize, <laughs> but You'll have to come through training to learn a little bit more about why that is. I've written some articles about that also in Forbes about like why business planning doesn't work for the typical entrepreneur. So I, I want to get to the question here. Well, there's a whole bunch of questions. Holy yeah, Mac, Ernest, or, from Ernestine, the fact that resources yeah, are exploited. Yeah, so basically, Gary, could you elaborate on your use of the word exploited? Because I think that may, there may be some um, lost in translation yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I meant exploited in the truest sense. What I meant, uh, uh, Ernestine, is that the attitudes and skills required to discover an opportunity, those are entrepreneurial skills, are distinct from the attitudes and skills required to exploit that opportunity. That is, that is monetize it, that is bring it to the world in a way that benefits others and benefits the self. That's what I meant by exploit. Right. Not not the pejorative sense. Um, yeah. In, yeah, in other yeah. words, to, to act on the opportunity it, that that's just vaguer uh, exploit. Yeah. If you, if you yeah. check the definition of exploit is a little more precise. Um, maybe we'll take one more and then save the others for, um, for the end, just in, in honor of time. Um, Thank so you. Yeah, Milka. I look forward to chatting with you more. 
What's the first turn for someone on a small local level in this week? Emotional disturbs. Uh, Jim, so, uh, we just yeah. answered that. Yeah, go go ahead, Gary. Let's yeah, let's yeah, keep I think rolling. Our, Arlene, I'm going to answer your question okay. here. Uh, I, I think so uh, uh, in, in our understanding of Ice House. But more broadly speaking, Arlene, what I'll say is you can't use the normal techniques of teaching. You can't use the tools of coercion that we normally use to teach, the carrot and stick. You know, what do I got to get to do to get the A? can't do that. We've got to rely on intrinsic motivation. We've got to help students uh, develop discovery skills, entrepreneurial discovery skills. So, all right, Nick, I'm going to keep rolling. You good yep. with that? Yep. All right, Please here do. we go. Okay. So, ah, how do I make these questions go away? Whoops. Now, what have I done? You see, can you see my slides, Nick? Yes, I can't see any questions, so just hit the X in the in the Q and A function. All right, let me get rid of that. Okay, so I'm backing up. Okay, uh, so here's how our Ice House Entrepreneurship Program works. There are four different versions of it. They all pretty much function the same. They've been manipulated a little bit for specific audiences. There's an original. There's a student success version which is sort of high school, college entry, how to succeed in school and in life. There's a small business for people who are, you know, for, for small business development folks. We've also, a few years ago, we launched a middle school version. They're a very successful uh, uh, offering in, in Erie PA. Here's how it works. And I'm going to be very, very brief here, right? We introduce the learner to these eight core competencies that we distilled from the observations of, of hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs. We then immerse them in real world ambiguity of opportunity discovery. Get out of the building, figure out how to make yourself useful to other humans without the guidance of a professional teacher, without the benefit of a predetermined path and a predictable outcome. It's a whole different game. Expose the learner to relatable social models. This is part of our secret sauce. Unless you're teaching at Stanford, stop talking about Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and start showing, exposing people, your students, to relatable social models, people who have come from similar or worse circumstances who are succeeding in this domain. We also want to encourage personal reflection, right? Your mindset is a belief system. I was talking to a friend of mine, a special forces guy, uh, a Marine Corps sniper on Sunday, and he said, you know, when, when, they, when they drop these, these special forces guys into a particular location, they're asked to move for 30 minutes, and then they're stopped and do a, what they call a SILS check, S-L-L-S. And that's an acronym for stop, look, listen, and smell. What we're kind of asking, you know, the learner to do is stop from time to time and think about your own thinking, to do a SILS check. How am I contributing to outcomes I don't want? And then lastly, this type of learning must be facilitated. It can't be taught. You know, I, as an example, I, I was in Riyadh in March speaking at the Global Entrepreneurship Congress. And I sat in on a session where this, this guy was boasting about his entrepreneurship program. And, you know, first we teach economics, then we teach marketing, then we teach finance, then we teach this. And, and you know, I said to the guy, you know, to the extent that we keep providing the directives is the extent to which we are undermining the student's ability to think for themselves, right? And, and so we have to facilitate, we can't instruct. So I'm gonna go through these very, very quickly now in, in a little more detail, right? Here are the eight concepts. If you wanna do a deeper dive, I suggest you buy a copy of the book you can get it on Amazon. It's in you know all possible uh, formats. These are the observations from entrepreneurs. Number one, what we hear invariably from the entrepreneur is they have a compelling goal. They've chosen something to pursue, right? 
and and I won't get into a lot of the research now, but but it's that future positive orientation in the brain that enables the individual to access unprecedented problem solving abilities that are otherwise not available, right? Another way to think about this is like what happens to us in the absence of a compelling goal, right? We tend to fetter away our time, we get bored, we get distracted and so forth. So that's the compelling goal part. It's really lies in their power to choose. We also see in entrepreneurs, they tend to look at problems as potential opportunities. So, so this sort of is represents like a cognitive, a very subtle, but important and powerful cognitive shift. They start looking for problems to solve, right? Most of us are trying to run away from problems or avoid problems. They tend to be action oriented. And on the surface, it looks a little chaotic, but what they're actually doing is they're trying lots of little things. They're micro experimenting. They're taking micro risks. They're like an organism searching for a connection. They're trying lots of little things until they find something that works. They're learning. And this is something I'm, I'm just writing about right now in my new book. You know, it's funny. These entrepreneurs, they're not necessarily the scholarly types. You know, on average, they're, they're the C students. But you observe, you know, it, 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 and you dig in, you start to see that they're avid learners. They're curious and creative, and they're, they're learning all the time, but they're not necessarily learning in a classroom. They're listening to audio books. They're, they're, they're watching YouTube videos. They're, they're uh, uh, you know, taking online courses. They're, they're learning from their peers. The point is they're, they're sort of optimized for learning and that gives them this enormous, and that's how they get the 200 horsepower out of their 200 horsepower engines. And so this begs the mindset question, why aren't we all learning like that, right? I, I just, I'm about to drop a new episode on our podcast from a guy named uh, Tremaine Davis. You know, he's talking about learning in the margins on his way to the grocery store, you know, 10 minutes, right? We're always looking for nuggets and little insights that can help advance our ideas. We notice in entrepreneurs that they're very resourceful. They tend to invest their discretionary time, thought, effort in advancing their ideas rather than in recreation and leisure. They tend to be reliable, right? They're very customer focused. They, they, they take simple ideas and yet they delight their customers. And by doing so, opportunity tends to find them. It's a very simple, they develop a reputation for being consistent, for being reliable, for, you know, going above and beyond. And as a result, they can turn the crappiest job into a fantastic career. They also tend to surround themselves with other entrepreneurial people. The power of this is not to be underestimated. Most of us surround ourselves with people who just reinforce uh, uh, our own beliefs, people who think and act pretty much like we do. And lastly, we see this ability to persist. Many of these entrepreneurs have said to me when it came down to is I just refuse to give up. Right. My first idea didn't work. I got a little further on my second idea. And then the third idea got a little further. And, you know, I went through all this challenge and frustration and setback, but it ultimately, uh, it ultimately worked. So then we immerse the student in the process as we get into the second of the life lessons, introduce the student to the idea that problems are opportunities in disguise. We developed this tool called the Ice House Opportunity Discovery Canvas. One of the things we noticed is that, you know, it, it's, it's basically a three-step process. It begins with problem finding. That's the exploration, inquiry, and observation, right? And this is largely absent from the discourse. Most people start with a solution. 
And what we're saying is, whoa, 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 stop, go back upstream and really spend some time to understand the problem you are trying to solve. Understand it from the perspective of the people who are trying to solve it. Once you understand, there's some questions, some guiding questions to kind of lead through that. Once we understand the problem, then we start designing and conducting experiments using what we call an MVP, a minimally viable product. What can you do with the few dollars? Well, you know, how can you test your idea? What people say they want and what they actually buy are two different things, right? So you can't, well, you can't really rely on people's opinions, whether it's the opinion of a customer or the opinion of, of an outside perspective. And then so what we encourage is this sort of iterative experimental process here between the first and second phases here. Then once we find evidence of usefulness, whether that's people paying for it, whether that's subscribers, whether it's buy-in from your colleagues, whether it's followers, doesn't matter. It's an evidence-based process. That's the key. What we see is that these entrepreneurs are actually following the scientific method, right? They're looking for problems. They, they spend some time to understand the problem from, the, from an empathic perspective. They conduct experiments. Once they have evidence of usefulness, then they replicate the experiment and grow from there. They begin to communicate the value of what they have. It's also important, as I said, to expose the learner to relatable social models. And throughout the Ice House programs, there are short little video vignettes. So the key concepts are reinforced from the firsthand experience of everyday entrepreneurs. All right. Lastly, we encourage personal reflection for the reasons we've already said. How am I contributing to outcomes I say that I don't want, right? Metacognition is the technical term. You know, honestly, why doesn't somebody create a, a, a freshman seminar around mindset? You never have to mention the word entrepreneurship. If we could just help people understand the way a mindset regulates our ability to, to, to harvest the output we have from our capabilities, it could change a lot of lives. Lastly, it's about facilitating rather than instructing, right? And we use these concepts from the work of Albert Bandura. We, we want the student to get a small win relatively early in the process. We expose them to the relatable social models. We act initially as the guide, as the mentor, the champions, but we early on encourage the learner to go out and identify and interact with local entrepreneurs and create your own mentors or in a, 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 a network of advisors and mentors and support people who want you to win. And then lastly, we, we have some tools to help the learner develop the ability to self-regulate their emotional responses. And, I, you know, we could do a whole class on that, but really, uh, you, you just can't get wrapped around the axle every time something goes wrong. You got to learn how to uh, uh, take responsibility for mistakes, to learn from errors and setbacks, and continue to move forward. That's it in a quick nutshell. Uh, since we launched, the Ice House program has gone all over the world. We've been recognized by the Kauffman Foundation as redefining entrepreneurship in classrooms and communities around the world. We have nearly 3,300 facilitators trained. We have our 101st facilitator training underway right now. You know, here are some of the Test the, the, the thousands of testimonials we've gotten from our various programs. This is one from Erie, Pennsylvania, from a video that uh, was made by uh, the, the, the nonprofit. Uh, help me out here, Nick. Who was that? Uh, United Way funded the initial uh, 800 student pilot in Erie. Fantastic outcomes. Community colleges, enormous impact on students' ability to persist, right? And organizational development, this is one we didn't see coming. Like, 
city government of, of Albuquerque using the Ice House program to train 6,000 city government workers how to think like entrepreneurs, saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars every year for the city of Albuquerque while making an enormous impact on, on worker engagement. Also workforce and uh, development folks, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of work with Career Source Florida. Uh, I'm fond of saying underneath the skills gap, there's a mindset gap. And, and we can't, we have to look at the ways in which we continue to teach people to think like employees and start teaching them to also think like entrepreneurs. From a community engagement perspective, NC Idea in North Carolina, uh, run by Tom Rue, is a fantastic partner. They've trained about 300 facilitators uh, to, uh, to in Ice House Middle School, High School, Community College, University, Small Business Development Centers, Community Development Initiatives all across North Carolina. They're committed to putting 100,000 North Carolinians through the Ice House program. We just got notified last week that there's a grant uh, uh, was written for over a million dollars to train in, in workforce development using the Ice House opportunity, uh, excuse me, the Ice House Entrepreneurial Mindset programs. So that's it. If you want to learn more, there's a ton of e resources and information on our website at elimindset.com. Our next public facilitator training is March 6th through 27th, 2023. We just started our, our um, November training last Friday. We also, you know, we, we can come to you if you want to do an in-house training. We do a lot of that. Uh, um, we're working on a project now to train 200 educators in, uh, in South Africa. But if you want us to... Uh, uh, you know, to come to your organization, we do that a lot. We do uh, one-day workshops. We do the full online training. We can do it in person. We can do it online. Uh, uh, so it, it, I'm, I'm going on and on now. Um, that's really it, Nick. I, I know I we don't have, you know, hopefully, folks, if you have questions, you can stick around. I I, I hope this is helpful. I'm happy to take uh, whatever questions you might have. Yeah, um, no immediate questions other than one that I typed an answer to that I wanted to highlight. Uh, Fatimata from, I believe she said she was in Paris, uh, was asking about how a researcher could get engaged with us. That training that Gary was just talking about uh, would be the best place to start. That's usually how we bring folks kind of into the fold and engage with them um, with our content. So that would be... yeah. A good spot yeah, and that. thank you for that question. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a new book called Mindset 2.0. I mean, Ice House, you know, my first book that I wrote with Clifton Talbert is really anecdotal, and, and I didn't really understand the breadth of what I had stumbled into, and I've spent the last... 10 years continuing to interview entrepreneurs, but really delving into the research in social and behavioral cognitive psychology and anthropology mm -hmm. to really understand, you know, how to create the conditions and, and that, that cultivate entrepreneurial mindsets. And this gives me the opportunity to really say what I'm trying to say here. The, the entrepreneurial mindset only looks, you know, the entrepreneur often looks sort of like an enigmatic figure to us, a mysterious figure who has some sort of scientifically unfathomable abilities. But that's only because we are so steeped in a managerial paradigm. And as Edgar Schein taught us, we can't really understand someone else's mindset until we can understand our own. And so that's what our, our new book is really about. We need managerial mindsets. Managerial mindsets are rooted in, in assumptions of, 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 of efficiency. It's about the efficient replication of known things that are known to be useful. And we need that. 
But these managerial paradigms are generally not conducive to exploration, experimentation, and discovery. And we now need both. And this is what we need researchers to help us with. Like, so we, what we need to do is we, as individuals, we need to develop the cognitive ambidexterity so that we can shuffle back and forth between a managerial frame of mind and an entrepreneurial frame of mind, right? The trick to survival is to understand which set of circumstances we're in and which set of rules to apply. So, uh, you know, we have to learn how to, in, in our model that I'm in, in what I'm promoting in this new book is, is that, you know, I'm not advocating that we quit our jobs, drop out of school, go get venture capital and go all in. And what we're saying is preserve the core of what you have, but use some small modicum of your discretionary time, thought and effort to explore new ways to make yourself more useful to more humans. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by undertaking an entrepreneurial project of your own, right? Take $50 and try to turn it into $500 in your spare time by making yourself useful. And when you get to $500, try to make that into $5,000 in your spare time. And by the time that happens, your life will have been changed irrevocably. And by the way, the research shows that employees who have side hustles are, are tend to be much more engaged in their day jobs. So for those of you who might be employers or organizational leaders, uh, you know, fear not. Yeah. Well, um, I just want to highlight this again because we had a question in the chat. We will be sending the recording of this along with the slides within 24 hours of the presentation. So no worries there. Um, and if you have any other questions for Gary or myself about Eli, about what we've been talking about philosophically, et cetera, feel free to respond to that follow-up email and I'll be sure to answer it myself or get the questions to Gary or someone else who can answer them. Thank you all. Uh, we're, we're past time now. So in, in uh, respect of everyone's time, let's, um, let's sign off for today and hope to see you next time, everyone. Yep. Great to have you guys here. Thank you. If we can help you with something, if you think this is going to help somebody else, please share uh, with others. I really appreciate yes. your time today. Grateful for all of you for being here and for the work you're doing. Yes. To each and every one of you. Thank you.